Welcome back to the Fearless Future podcast. We're your hosts, Glenn Schwarm. And Amber Schwarm. And today is part two of our contractor series. So hopefully you already listened to episode one. If not, you can get it right here and then come back and listen to this one. So I think the other thing I want to talk about is that we're talking about, you know, interviewing people. We mentioned this before a little bit. You mentioned their trucks and see, you know, what kind of job, but visit the actual job site that they're on. Find out what jobs they're on right now and visit those job sites to make sure they're legitimate. Do not rely on pictures. Yeah. Can I tell them why? Go ahead. So we hired a contractor to come do our office and he was a loud mouth. Oh, was he a loud mouth? He was a yeller and a screamer and yelled at his guys and he got the work done. But when he first came to us, he brought a bunch of, a bunch of pictures of a mall called Crossgates Mall in upstate New York, where we were from. And he said, I did this atrium in Crossgates. And I knew of the atrium. I said, oh, wow, that's a, that's a big project. He said, oh, yeah, sure. Had all the pictures of the scaffolding and all that kind of stuff. Great. Well, as it turns out, we had to fire him at the very end of the job. He screwed me out of a $7,000 check that I gave me, promised me back the next day. And lo and behold, when you pay somebody and they don't finish the work, 90% of the time, they screw you. I don't care how ethical they say they are. It's just something that contractors, I think they're just taught that when they're born, like get the last payment, then skedaddle. So he did. He screwed me for seven grand. I was so pissed. And I found out that day, one of his guys said, did he show you the Crossgates pictures? I go, yeah. He goes, yeah, that wasn't his job. I go, what do you mean? He goes, he went there at night and had us climb up on the scaffolding that was already there and took pictures during when the when my contractors had left and took pictures of us up there with our shirts on. So it looked like us working. And I'm like, you piece of crap. Yeah. So go to a job site to make sure that you know that that's really what they're doing. They're really and doing ask for that. referrals and call those referrals. Yes, but go to a job site because a referral yes. could be their brother, their best it's friend, true. their it neighbor. Yeah. So just be, be, you know, just be be on the lookout for that when you're when you're doing that because again, they're not all ethical. And again, you mentioned before, but look look how they run and the condition of their job. How how is the job site run? Is it clean? If you go there after hours, is it clean? Is it picked up? Are there nails every place? Is there junk every place? Their trucks look junky. What's it look like? Yeah. That gives you an idea of who you're working with. So, all right, let's do our stupid human comments. We always try and find a comment that someone makes on one of our posts. And uh, here's our stupid human comment of the week. This all is, right. This is from Dennis Linden, 3657. Do we know what episode this was on? I do not. All right. So the comment's pretty quick and simple. Realtors suck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bad so, experience? Yeah. So let's talk. So just for a minute. So I, I don't know what episode that was even even about, but the realtors suck thing. You know, it's like any profession. You've got your 80 percent, you know, 80 percent do nothing or kind of just there or whatever. Then 20 percent do all the work with the 80, 20 principles still alive and well in realtors. It might be more like, you know, 10 percent do a lot of the work and 90 percent are just kind of part timers kicking the tire around and just trying to pretend like they're realtors. They don't know what they're doing. Yeah. But we just recently had the huge NAR uh, National Association of Realtors. Um, I think it was a hundred, hundreds of millions or billion dollar settlement, whatever it was. And where they, they said that you can no longer, the realtor can no longer dictate what the, what the buyer's commission is going to be. And now they have to be all separate. So there's a lot of controversy happening right now yep. inside the space shaking about that. Shaking up the industry. It is. It's completely shaking it up. And a lot of realtors have been pushing back saying, no, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. But I think we're going to see a major shift in how sellers sell houses because it won't be too long before a seller says, I'm not paying 5% because that's normally what you do now. Now, now you sign an agreement for five or 6% to sell your property and two and a half percent would go to the buyer's agent. Right. Well, that's no longer allowed. That's not legal anymore. You can't do that. So sellers, now they can negotiate and say, if you do 6%, I'm going to give this and hopefully people will keep business as the same. But I think that sellers are going to start saying, no, I'm not paying that. Let them pay for their own way. Let the buyer pay for their own if representation. Agent, yeah. All of a sudden, the game's going to change. So I think that right now, people are holding fast saying, no, listen, these are going to, these are going to be just the same. But the truth is, a, a lawsuit that big is not going to keep things the same. Yeah. I think people are going to start pushing back. I think sellers are going to start saying, I'm not going to pay 6%. I'm not going to pay 5 Matter of fact, I'm going to pay 2 You want 2 dollars I'm going to pay you 2 now. Because all of a sudden, it's, it becomes aware to sellers that they can negotiate that. And buyers can negotiate too. So I think we're going to see a major shift. I think a lot of the part-time realtors are going to fall off because you're going to be a professional negotiator now. And even to go look at a house, you're going to have to sign papers now. Because right. there's no guarantee they're going to get paid ever. Right. So it won't be just calling a realtor and go looking at a house anymore. 
And it's going to be a mess for a while until it gets straightened out. But what a massive shift. So, yeah, not just, so the yeah, realtors that it, you think suck, <laughs> um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dennis, whatever your name Dennis is there. Linden. What the realtors you think suck probably won't be here anymore after after a while. And it'd be, it, it should be more of a professional operation well, for a while. Well, to me, that's just such a random comment, too, because like any industry and any anybody in like there's people that suck. It's not just realtors like, you know, there's sucky hairdressers and sucky yeah, massage therapists and like, you know, I know. All right, let's talk about uh, hiring contractors. So, so now you have to hire people, right? So we talked about how to vet them or how to find them, how to vet them. And now you have to hire them. And this, this is kind of your specialty. So I'll let you take over. Yeah. So, you know, number one, I think that you want to show up organized yourself and, and in charge. And this is a really good way to do it is to, to develop a scope of work. And the scope of work I refer to as the project Bible. And when you show up and meet a contractor for the first time and you have a detailed scope of work, you're setting yourself up for success and you're starting that relationship off the right way. And you're saying, you know, again, it's, it's showing that you're in charge. You know exactly what you want done in every single room down to the paint color, your light fixture skew, what toilet you want to use, like that the scope of work outlines everything that you want done room by room. So not only does that scope of work include the details of what you want done in each room, but it also has a payment schedule attached. And this is how you stay in charge of the money. Because when you hire a contractor, it's really easy for them to say, if you don't have anything to measure it by, it's really easy for them to say, oh, I'm 50% done with the work or I'm 30% done with the work. I want a 30% payment, a third payment. And if you don't have anything to measure that by, you're just going, uh... Okay, I'm looking around, seeing a little bit done. All right, I guess you're right. But the the payment schedule is itemized out into phases. You know, the first phase might be demo, and then the second phase is like rough end plumbing and electrical, and then framing, and then it, you know it goes on from there, flooring and paint, and you know finish uh, the trim work and punch out all that stuff. And those are broken down into like ten to fifteen percent inc increments. So. I didn't issue a payment until that phase was done. Sometimes I might issue a 50% payment on that phase if paint was halfway done and they needed to pay their guys or whatever. But at least you have something to measure the progress of the work being done. So that that sets up the relationship to, you know, in, instead of just guessing about what's getting done, you like I said, you can measure it. But the contractor also has a goal to reach. That's what I was trying to get to a second ago. The contractor has a goal to reach so they know when they get paid because contractors are, are most of the time really good at their trade. They're not always good business people. Correct. So what happens with them is, oh, it's Friday. I got to pay my guys. I need a payment from you. But what can happen is you can get really upside down on the job because you get to the end of the job. The money that you had budgeted is all gone because he had to pay his guys every Friday. And guess who doesn't show up again? Right. That's when, that's when they don't show up. I think that rookies exactly. make that mistake over and over. They want to help the contractor. Right. And th there's a relationship that you want to build there. We're going to talk about how to manage them and how to build the relationship and keep them. But that's, it's a crucial part. Like you said, that scope of work puts you in charge. Yeah. If you have that, you, you look like you know what you're talking about, not just saying, hi, can you make my house look pretty? And, and they have, you're setting up proper expectations. You know, when XYZ is done, I will get you, issue you a payment. Talk about that payment schedule. So payment schedule, you just, you just sort of touched on that. And then do you pay them beforehand ever? <laughs> no, never pay them before the work is done. Yeah. That, that's what in the beginning I say, I love paying my contractors because when I am issue a payment, that means work is completed. Yeah. So Nobody don't don't up. come to me begging for money because it's Friday and you need to pay your guys. Get the job done and I will be happy to issue you a check. One of the common questions that we always get too is, listen, you know, who buys the material? Yeah. And I think we've done it both ways. We have. And so maybe we can talk about that for a minute. Yeah, when we, you know, I used to like to buy all the material because I like the credit card points that we would get because we'd use those for travel or whatever. Well, plus it was better for us to buy them on our credit card than it was to give a contractor a check and the extra hope, right, and hope that, that they would pay for yeah. it. Because if you give a contractor a check for, well, I got to have 10000 up front, I got to buy material. And they use that money to go pay a bill later on or to pay payroll that week because they're not a good business person. And now they don't have the money to buy your stuff. That happens too. Right. Or, or they buy inferior product. Because you wanted a certain type of insulation or you wanted a certain kind of window and they buy cheaper things, you know, or use stuff because they're trying to save money yep. to make more money in the job. So we had more control. That was one of the big reasons that we did it back then. But the problem with that, too, is that 
then they order a little extra material and then they Correct. use it on the side of, of their own jobs or their own house. Yeah, and, yeah they, a few more pieces of sheetrock. And, right. and you wouldn't necessarily notice, no. but yet we're paying for it. Right. So yeah, so anyway. So there, there's a downside to that too, especially when you're doing multiple jobs. It's a little harder to keep an eye on all, all that. Once you develop a good relationship with a contractor, you know, and you you have that trust kind of built up, then it's probably a, a better idea to let them buy the materials so you're not having all that Headache. worry about that excess and headache. Sure. Um, probably my favorite method that we did was we let the contractor buy all the small stuff. And because I do still like those credit card points. So we would buy some of the bigger things like the appliances. You know, those were usually $2,500 worth of appliances, um, the the flooring and uh, the tile. Hmm. Those were like big ticket items that we would we right. would buy. So we still got most of the credit card yeah. points, but then we let the headache yeah. be on them for the rest. So you of the can stuff. do what you want to do. I mean, the bottom line is you can do what you want to do, but just be be a, be aware that you do put yourself at risk with a new contractor if you give them a big deposit check up yes. front because they have to buy material. I would stretch that out over some time. You, you so do the, it in phases. Do it in phases. Do it right? in the phases. Listen, yeah. I'm not going to buy all the material up front. We're going to buy some of it for that phase, yep. and then I would. This kind of leads into the next the, one of the next things is. Um, well, when it comes to managing the job, you want to make sure that those materials are actually on the job when you're there. So that's important. So then the next step is you're going to walk the property with the contractor. So, so we're going to walk the property. And, with scope of work in hand. Right. Walk through and say, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what you're going to do and all that. If everybody agrees, then the contractor signs your contract. Right. You have a contract that has things included in there like late payments. A timeline. If you're done, I think our people now pay $250 a day if they are late yep. on the job. Now, we have room and we also have a, a mechanism that allows us to say, listen, you know, during the job, if this adds three more days, then we add three more days to the completion of the project. Right. But if, it's, a, it's a mechanism that we don't use very often, but we certainly do if things get out of hand or you don't show up. You decide you're going to try, if you're a contractor, you're doing multiple jobs and you're not managing your time right, I'm not going to pay the penalty no. for that. You're going to pay me for my time. Yeah. You're going to pay, you're going to pay and, a penalty. And if they're late on the job, you know, if they're three weeks over their timeline that you gave you them, fortune. then that costs you a fortune in holding costs because you're still paying interest on the money that you All borrowed that. on the house. You're still paying taxes. You're still paying insurance. Yeah. So, you know, you don't, you're still doing power bill. You know, you don't want all that money just to go around the, on, down the toilet because your contractor's off doing yeah. another job. Make sure they know at the end of the job, you and by the way, you have to have all the insurance documents before they step foot in the yes. job. And you have to be named additional important. insured. We talked about that before. That's that's a crucial thing to do. Know that when the job is done, that last payment, they're going to sign off a on the job waiver. a lien release waiver, saying that they cannot put a lien on the house because you have bet you have they've been paid in full. Right. If you leave that if you leave that thing hanging out there, they can come back and put a lien on the property. You won't be able to sell it, and they try and negotiate with and you, and a it's a very headache. difficult thing to do. Yep. So it's a lot. So. Uh, that's that's how that works. So that's hiring contractors. Now let's talk about managing contractors. I know there's a lot going on here. There's a lot of meat in this episode, but I want to make sure we get to it. Managing the job site. Yeah. So you're going to visit the job site as often as possible. Um, I tell people, you know, if they're brand new and this is a new relationship that with a contractor, you want to be there every day. For sure. You, you want to be there every day, making sure that they showed up, they did what they were supposed to do, what they agreed to do, and that that they're they're holding up their end of the bargain. So, yeah. so, and, and it keeps them on their toes too. You I know, mean, if you're, if you're just randomly doing spot checks and showing up, you know, they're going to know I better be here when they show up. They, and then call them on it. If they're not on the job site, you yeah. say, Hey, I don't Where see you on the job site. Where are you today? Right. right. That's a really important thing you can do. There are some electronic ways you can do that. If you are kind of a long distance person, but you can have a uh, camera on the site or you can have an access code to get in the door that notifies you. You're going to have to have Wi-Fi set up to do that. So it might be yeah. a little tricky, but depending on the job site, but you can do it. So you get notified when they show up and when they leave. Yeah. So you can do that as well. So there's, there's ways to do electronically, but you want to make sure that you are managing that, make sure that they're showing up. That's important because when you're there in person, you get to see things and see if they know what they're doing. I want you to talk about that, that douche who, yeah. who, 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 who tried to talk that tried to Mr. Pretty Boy tried to yeah. bat his eyes Mr. at you. Mr. Blue Eyes. Because this is how showing up at the job site every day stopped a major problem with a guy that didn't know what the heck he was doing. So talk yeah, about that. Yeah, he was a younger contractor, but, you know, he interviewed well and we hired him for the job. Um, but we go in and we were converting a, a closet into a little half bath. And so I go in and the sheetrock was done, but there was no electrical done. And I'm like, I'm like, that's, that's not right. Where are our outlets? You know, we need the box for the light to go up. And so I called him on it and he's like, oh yeah, I was going to do that after. Yeah. And we both looked and at I'm like, like, 
what? I said, I did, I haven't, I, for he, some reason, I remember, gonna, let, it, let me, it, it was our 17th flip. I remember that number for some reason. Let, let me clarify for the, for all the listeners though. It's important to know that, you know, if you don't know about construction, if you're building a new wall, you'll run the wires, electrical wires in the, the wall in, yeah. that have a rough in box, and then you'll cut that box out. So you, you're running wires and doing stuff before the sheetrock goes up. Think about that. It makes a lot more sense you to run You never do sheetrock before you do rough in electric. Correct. So now, now continue. So, so I remember him saying I was going to do that after. And I, I think I actually said to him, I had did, I've not done 17 flips. You know, do you see like stupid stamped on my forehead? Uh, you did. You said like, that. And I, Cause I think I was so tired of being underestimated by these guys too. Yeah. Cause I was just some dumb blonde girl from Texas that, you know, these New York guys thought they could just like pull the wool over my eye. And I think at that point I was just like really fed up with done. being underestimated. Yeah. And so we fired him, I think the next day. But yeah, we did. But it, that, but that by going to the job set every day, I saw it. We saw that he yeah. didn't know what he was doing. Right. And then we're, so we were able to, to, you know, fix a potential major problem down the road because right. you imagine trying to run wire after oh and gosh. shipping the wire and oh man it, what a, what a nightmare such a so if you're long distance i mentioned this before make sure that you're getting nowadays you have technology we in the early days we didn't do so well with those ones we had to drive an hour and a half yeah. to but now you can get video every day you can get a video recap of the day from the contract you can get pictures every day yep. of the work that's being done and again use electronics if you need to to watch the job site yourself yeah. It's your job, baby. You want to make money, you got to you, you manage that job. So, all right, listeners, we're kind of wrapping up. We got one more section to go through, but I want to do our fun Gen X moment. I want to play a clip that's maybe a little bit uh, applicable here. I'm going to play this clip for you. You tell me if you know the movie. It's going to date you a little bit because it was mid 80s, but you'll know the actor and actress. So let's run that clip now. Anna and Walter are young, single, and in love. They've got good jobs, fabulous address. futures, a magnificent new home that they bought for a song. Who says they can't have it all? It's gonna be fun fixing it up, you'll see. Gonna need some work. Five grand, five thousand dollars? That's just a deposit. A little work. When do you think you can start? Just as soon as your check clears. A little care. Do you really buy this house? Yes, it is. <laughs> a little imagination, and it's gonna be great. Hold on, Mr. Hey, Mr. Fielding, don't worry about a thing. Okay, guys. Oh, uh, <laughs> do you remember that movie? Uh, I don't. I, re I mean, I recognize Tom Hanks' um, voice, but. Yeah, Tom Hanks and Shelley Long. Shelley Long was from Cheers, but that was a call movie called The Money Pit. They bought a house and no, no matter what they did, the contractors kept screwing them over and over and the wow. house kept falling apart. So they bought a house that, you know, flips weren't a thing back then, but somebody had cobbed the house together. So it's just kind of a funny uh, thing from our Gen X days um to uh to link in today's episode so the last section i want to talk about is how do you keep that contractor how do you keep that contractor happy yeah the the number one thing i think is you got to know their love language and if you are a woman and you have a family you know that's you, you know that every kid that you have is a little different they learn differently they respond to discipline differently they respond to affection differently so that's a, that's a really good way to think of contractors too you know some contractors you can be pretty friendly with and you can, you know, show up on Friday with the with pizza and beer for their crew. And they're really grateful for that. And you'll get along great. Other contractors need that tough love yeah. and they need to know, you know, you, you got to kind of crack the whip and stay on top of them. And you got to kind of help keep them organized. But if they're yes, that is a little more on you. But if they're doing well in other aspects of the job, it might be worth it to to have to have that personality with them. Um, so if you just kind of know what makes them tick. I think also keep good professional boundaries with contractors. Oh, yeah. You've got to keep good boundaries. And <clears throat> what I mean is they they have problems just like you do. You've got problems. They've got problems. But sometimes they start using their problems to manipulate you to, yeah. to pay. And the more the more friendly you are with them, if you invite them over to your family barbecue or your neighborhood barbecue, not a great idea. Yeah. You get too friendly with contractors, they, they will almost always take advantage of that. Right. Uh, most of them will, will, you know, if you get too, we've done that. You just get too yep. close where they know too much. If they know about the job site, if they hear how much you make, if they're following, you know, whatever, you got to be so careful about all yep. that because they forget you're taking all the risk. So they forget right. that. So when they get closer to you, they think, oh, well, I should get a piece of that. I'm like family here. I should get a piece of that. So just be very careful of not getting too close to your contractor. But just keep that professional. 
boundary. Yeah. And the, the other thing about that is too, they think they know the numbers, you know, let's just for easy numbers. They think, oh, they bought, they bought the house for a hundred. They paid me 30. They sold it for 200. They're making $70,000. Yeah, right. They have no idea. They, they don't know about all of the taxes and insurance and the cost of the money and the cost of holding and the yeah. commissions and the buying costs and the selling yeah. costs. And yeah. so they can they can quickly think that we're making a whole lot more yeah. than they are and they get a little greedy. So just keep those boundaries and yeah. keep them busy with new projects. Yeah. When they're getting close to finishing one, say, hey, I have a new one coming, like dangle that carrot and say, I have a new one coming down the road. Right. Are you interested in doing that one too? And if you can do that, that's a good thing to keep them busy. And that's a good relationship to have with people. And the last piece I want to talk about is their shelf life. Yeah. Yeah, their shelf life. You know, sometimes we've we've had people that last, you know, three, four, five jobs. Sometimes they last a couple of years. But I think contractors by nature are contractors. They don't like working for the same person over yeah. and over. You know, they they like being their own boss. They don't like feeling like they're tied down to- It might feel like a job. Right, exactly. If they keep coming back to the same person, it might feel like a job exactly. after a while. Exactly. So some contractors have a shelf life. Yeah. Not all though, because ironically, not too long ago, I was back home in New York and we have a contractor, Sean, who's worked for us for apparently nine years. And I had met him before. I kind of forgot because there's a lot of contractors yeah. come and go. And I think I met him in the office, pick up a check one day. And uh, back when I was you know, running the company, but uh, I- he went and helped my mom. He did a fantastic job. He said, I've been with you for nine years now. You know that? And I thought, I said, oh, great. And I walked in and thought, nine years? I just yeah. meeting him now? But you know, he, but that's, that's the kind of company we've run is that he loves being with us and he's the guy that's right there behind us. So when you find a good one, yep. keep them. Like keep that relationship strong and do all these things we just talked about and you'll have a great experience with the contractor. So again, don't be intimidated by contractors. They are, a, they are an absolute necessity on your team. And if you have great ones, you can make a lot of money and so can they and everybody can be happy. It can be a win-win. So that concludes this episode of the Fearless Future podcast. If you liked it, make sure you click that like button and make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss anything in the future. 